first speaker for this session, uh, I'm sure he will deliver a very stylish performance uh, with a name like that, Massimiliano Versace. And I just learned there is actually a, fa a, fa a family link to that, but if you want, you can talk to him about this later. Um, uh, he wants robots to learn like living things intuitively, okay? Um, so he looked at how we respond and how we act, and he wants to use that to change, quote, the way robots are designed. It does sound a bit like Blade Runner or Terminator or stuff like that, okay? It sounds a bit scary, but actually there's a point to it. And the question is, how fictive is the science that he's doing? Welcome, Massimiliano. Thank you. Thank you. So if all aliens would be able to access about planet Earth with the YouTube videos, they might think the Earth is mostly populated by robots. Humanoid walking robots, flying robots, uh, cow-shaped weird-looking robots, self-driving cars, and so forth. The truth is that most of these robots are nowadays still stuck on YouTube. And the reason is that because they fundamentally lack intelligence and autonomy. Stepping back, in order for robots to get unstuck from YouTube and enter everybody's life, three main challenges have to be tackled. And I like to call these the brain, the mind, and the body challenges. So with bodies, I mean inexpensive robotic bodies that can be mass produced and enter everybody's house or workplace. That's not enough. You also need what I like to call the mind, which are algorithm, powerful, mathematically defined algorithm that gives this body a, a smart behavior. But this is not enough. Yet, you also need what I like to call brains, which are computing substrate or processor that are inexpensive enough, low power enough, yet powerful enough to run this very complex mind in a little piece of hardware that you can put in a robot and you can put in a robotic body. So all these three miracles need to happen at once to uncage uh, robots from YouTube. So let's look at the body. The body is where the good news are. Uh, if just a few years ago I would have gone uh, to buy one of these ro robots for my research lab, I would have spent thousands of dollars. So today I can buy one of these robots at a fraction of the price. And I like to think, uh, to make you think of robots not only in terms of robots, but cars and airplanes are today becoming a robot. If you go and buy a sedan, you find much of the sensor that once they were typical of robots in, in your car. And part of the decreasing cost of robots is due to the, to the decrease uh, in the cost of sensors, which make the biggest bulk uh, of the price of a robot. And uh, you guys raise your hand in the prior talk, everybody has a, has a smartphone. So when you go and buy a smartphone, you're actually decreasing the price of sensors. Sensors such as camera, that give robots eyes, microphones that give ro robots ears, and accelerometer gyros when you, know, when you tilt your screen, GPS, all those uh, sensors can give robots uh, the sense of equilibrium or the sense of spatial awareness. So go buy a cell phone, you're decreasing the cost of robots. So the body is on its way to be solved. How about the mind? Well, robots can be put in two main buckets. One are remote control robots. And this kind of defeats the purpose, right? So you don't want one human and one robot. You want one human, a fleet of robots, so, so you can expand your productivity. So that's not good. How about autonomous robots? Well, <clears throat> not there yet. OK. So I am biased. Uh, I come from the neuroscience background. But I believe that the biological brain is the right metaphor to create intelligent robots. And biological brains achieve their tremendous power, behavioral power. They give us our incredible behavioral repertoire by mixing two very simple ingredients, learning and parallel processing. And this is actually true across many, many species from the little rat to the pinnacle of evolution, humans. So that's what we started doing many years ago. Uh, we started with DARPA, which is notorious to do crazy projects. Uh, one of these crazy projects was the internet that turned out to be quite good. This was my project where DARPA asked us to build an artificial brain for a robot. And that's how it looked like. A bunch of spaghetti boxes with spaghetti. And uh, you know, each one of those spaghetti boxes has more spaghetti and boxes inside. Uh, but that's how we started. We put together a, a big brain uh, that had 32 million neurons and 13 billion synapses, which are the connection between, between neurons. 
And then we took it to NASA, and that's who, who I've been working with for the past couple of years. And the goal that NASA set was, you have to create an artificial brain for the Mars rover. You don't want to wait 20 minutes to, to know what's happened, you know, to send the signal back and forth to Mars. You want, to be, you want this to be autonomous, to, to live in the recharge base, go around, explore Mars, pretty much like you go out of your house, explore your environment, and come back to your home without the need of any GPS information or any expensive sensor. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, this shows a little uh, snippet of uh, uh, our robot navigating around uh, a simulated Mars environment. And you know, it leaves the base at a certain point and it runs out of battery and flies back uh, to the charging base. And underneath, you can see how the robot sees. So each one of these white dots is actually a fixation point. As you move your eye, humans, around, that's where the, the robot eyes land. And then the rock, which are objects of interest for, for Mars, I guess that's that's what Mars is about. Um, when the rock becomes white, it's classified by the robot, it un is, is understood and moves around. And why did we do that? So why did we have a robot with an artificial eye that moves around? Uh, the first thing to, to look at is, well, humans do that, right? So this shows actually where humans look when they watch a movie. And the first thing you notice is that they don't look randomly around. They are very purpose purposefully looking at very specific area in the, in the image. All of them, right? So you see this hot spot moving around. Everybody's pretty much looking at the same spot. Why? Well, it turns out that our eye is pretty weird. <laughs> our retina has a very, retina is our sensor in the, in the eye, has a very high resolution in the middle, which falls off in the periphery. So we are basically blind apart from this much of our visual field. And we can actually all see it together right now. Put your thumb at the arm's length, pull out your program, and without cheating, so looking at the, at the tip of your thumb, try to read something just a few degrees away. If you can read, you're cheating. So you can't. What, what's, why? Why is the brain doing that? Why we cannot see the whole world at, as a high resolution TV? Because if you do the math, your brain will weigh 10,000 pounds. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a typical example of how understanding biology, which is something that has been done successfully with animals, you know, the brain for animals has, has worked, how we can take intuition from that side of the story and bring it to robotics so we don't build monstrosity like this. So that's what we did. This is a, a little decapitated uh, piece of our robot. We just took the, the head with the camera, and you can see the robot uh, looking around pretty much using the same anatomy and physiology of, uh, of human beings. And you can see uh, some of the stages of the neural model that basically, you know, uh, what, the, what it does, it looks around, classifies objects in the environment, and sort of build uh, a three-dimensional uh, you know, map, uh, map of the world. So the mind is getting solved. We are doing uh, lots of progress. How about the brain? Well, the brain, human brain, is a masterpiece. 100 billion neurons and 250 trillion synapses. So last time these numbers were other in this place where they were talking about the Italian uh, uh, depth, public depth. So we also have the same numbers of stuff in the brain, all right? So there is another use for those trillions. So everything, all I said, in a two uh, liter volume uh, with the power consumption of a light bulb unmatched. So if just a few years ago we wanted to reproduce this in a digital uh, computer, we would have filled a room as big as this one with supercomputers with a dedicated nuclear power plant just to provide the power. That's not scalable. But things are changing. Thanks to the multi-core revolution, things are changing to our advantage. So when you go to Best Buy and buy your next machine, you know, your next laptop, desktop, if people buy desktop anymore, uh, iPad or so forth, you don't find the one big processor, right? What you find is the dual core, four core, eight core, 16 core, and so forth. So the computer industry is building processors for reasons that are different from the brain, but not so much maybe, that are related to physical barriers. You cannot just build a very, very fast processor. It will burn your pockets. That's not fun. So the processors are becoming more and more similar to brains. And if people ask you, what can I do with a thousand processor on your cell phone? your answer from now on is going to be, I can run a brain. So that's the roadmap of what people will find 
uh, in their common devices in the digital domain. So these are common processors that everybody has. Uh, in green, you find the NVIDIA GPUs that stand for graphic processing units, which are basically processors built uh, for gamers at the beginning, so you can play your video games, me included, uh, now to render videos on the screen, and that's a progression. So lots of computing power in the next few years. And in blue, you see the number of computing cores, mobile cores that Intel forecast again in the next few years. So lots of power, lots of cores. And at the bottom, you see the so-called fancy processors. Uh, fancy processors are still pretty much in academia, but those are processors designed from the ground up by looking at the brain and building in silico. Circuits are very, very similar to the biological counterpart. And again, millions of neurons in the next few years. So what does this mean for us? For instance, let's take uh, the mouse brain. Half a gram, 70 million neurons. And by the way, if we could build today a mouse brain in a robot, we'll be all set. Okay, very, very smart. So we can build this thing in 2018 in a few square centimeters, something like this, plus or minus. Human brain, not so much. We still need a room or a house full of this processor, but this curve can be bent. And I'll give you two examples. So one is actually uh, thanks to a Fulbrighter. His name is Eric Markham. His video was running in the break, uh, who was awarded the so-called Human Brain Project, where the European Union, Union put $100 million for 10 years, $100 million per year for 10 years, so $1 billion to study the brain. And part of this effort is to, is to be processor, to which when they called across the street, I say, what? Europe? No way. I see their 100. I raised them too. So the, the United States came with the brain initiative, which is 300 millions. Yeah, for <laughs> yeah. So these things can change the game. But I believe that where the game really changes is where the private companies step in. So a few months ago, Qualcomm uh, came to Boston and gave a talk, and they introduced their zero NPU. And what is an NPU? NPU is neither a CPU, that is everywhere, or a GPU. It's a neural processing unit that, quote, not only mimic human-like perception, but also have the ability to learn how biological brains do. So that's exactly one of those fancy processors that I told you they're still stuck in academia, quietly leaving the lab and sneaking into one of the major corporations in the United States that ships processor on, on all your cell phones. So things are changing and are advancing pretty quickly also on the brain. So I believe that today we are living a time in which convergence in brain, mind, and body are actually allowing us today to build robots that can escape free of YouTube, finally. So the big challenge is how to get these robots integrated into society. And this problem is completely far from solved and will need the contribution of the smartest mind out there to get this right. Thank you. Grazie mille. Grazie mille, Massimiliano. And who knows, maybe one of the next TEDx Fulbrights will be hosted by a robot, you know, if this is continuing at that speed.